Oh yeah. Here we go. Hola, hey. como esta? We are hey, live. Josh. What's going on, Adam? Oh, you know, ready to cook, ready to cook. I'm super ready. excited. This is, uh, this, this is one of the, like the best breakfast sandwiches that you could possibly have. I know it's dinner, but hey, who out there doesn't sometimes have breakfast for dinner, right? I mean, it's good. Yeah, I, I don't know. I see. I don't think fried chicken dinner, but the egg, I, I could see. I, I could see what you're talking about. I, I could, I could get a little vibe on the dinner, breakfast thing. Yeah. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I guess so. I guess so. That's true. So um, we got a lot to make tonight. It's going to be busy, busy, busy here in this copycat kitchen. So is everybody ready to cook? Woo-hoo-hoo. Let me tell you a couple of things before we get going. Now, Josh, you all set tonight? Nothing's going to – you're good and ready to go? Nothing's going to fall? You ready I to mean, go? I, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure that I've got everything prepped, but you never know. There's there's always a chance that there's a curveball that comes in there, okay. and I am missing something. I think my main concern tonight is when I show everybody the amazing sandwich that I make that it doesn't slide Are right you off. Are going to keep it on the plate this time? Okay, that's a good yeah. idea. Yeah. It's a good idea. So yeah. let me tell you, let me tell you all a couple of things about um, Art Smith, who's the uh, the sandwich is from his place. Now, I got a little, I got a little tiny problem with um, a lot of the celebrity chef restaurants, and not just on Di- on you know Disney property, but all over the country, they always seem to disappoint me. But Art Smith is the exception to that rule, and I'm going to tell you the reason why. His food is really holds up well in like mass production, like the food we're making tonight, like it just works and it's not as exacting as some other chefs. I've eaten in his restaurants in Atlantic city, one other place. And it's, it's always good. It's always better. You know, sometimes guys that have celebrity restaurants, celebrity chefs, open restaurants, they miss beats because their food is really complicated and it can't execute properly, but his food executes properly. That's number one. Number two, I was looking for his cookbook. He has a great cookbook that I had for years. And when we moved recently, it's, it must be somewhere in my collection. But this this meal is about as Southern as Southern gets. So if you're not from the South, um, you're learning something cool. If you are from the South, well, then you know what I'm saying is true. Sawmill, sawmill, drop biscuits, you know, um, fried chicken. I mean, you can't get pimento cheese. You can't get any more Southern than this. But, well, and hey, and can I add something real quick, Adam? Um, sure. Especially from tonight, just just from this, you could just make yourself biscuits and gravy, which is something that I love to make for myself. Sometimes I'll give it to Taylor too. She'll she'll eat a little bit of it. But, you know, it's really good. It's fantastic. <laughs> One million percent. One million percent. I mean, you know, these classes are meant to, like, carry things away past the copycat aspect where, you know, it's like it's great for everything. The pimento cheese, by the way, I've put on restaurant menus. If you've never made pimento cheese before, it's a great dip. It's super simple, and I, I think that will also carry through. So before I get going, I just wanted to show you I was looking for my Art Smith book, but I have these three books that were really great. These are the Lee Brothers, Matt Lee. T- this is a great Southern cookbook. If you're interested, you could email me. This is um, Sylvia, Sylvia Soul Food. She had a famous restaurant in the city. She died recently. And um, they say the dean of uh, all Southern food was this woman named Edna Lewis, who wrote this great cookbook with uh, Scott Peacock. She also died recently. She was like a really like excellent Southern cook. And, you know, a lot of, you know, we have a lot of, you know, we, we have a lot of food traditions in this country. It's not just, you know, other countries. We have, you know, 200 and some odd years of cooking in our country, which is awesome and cool. So let's, uh, Let's represent. Okay, here we go. First thing we're going to make tonight are the cheddar biscuits. Cheddar biscuits. Okay, if you have a mixer, pull it out. If you don't have a mixer, you don't need one, you could use um, a big bowl. Okay, first going to go in the dry ingredients, two cups of all-purpose flour. Okay. Ah, I used the wrong flour. (laughs) Everything's really similar tonight. That's what's funny. So I have flour measured out, so I'm going to put this back because I use my flour for my chicken. (laughs) That will go back. 
Uh, I measured out some ingredients. Sometimes I don't measure them out. Tonight I did because there's a lot of things going on. All right. Pop that in there. Here it is. Two cups. All-purpose flour. Make sure I got the right flour this time. Good. Dry ingredients are always going to go in first. There's my baking powder right in there. I'm going to put on my paddle attachment. Okay. Um, garlic salt, garlic powder. I'm going to use some onion powder. Onion powder here is calling for a half teaspoon. I put in a little bit more. I don't think I have a problem with that. Am I looking? I want to make sure I'm reading the right thing. Cheddar cheese biscuits. Okay. There's that. Thanks. Salt shortening is going to go in last. Okay. So first thing I'm going to do is give a little mix to my garlic salt and my uh, baking powder and flour. Small mix. On top of this, <clears throat> it's gonna go a half teaspoon of salt. Okay. Okay. Now we're gonna do something called cutting in the fat. Now, biscuits, very common when you're cutting in fat to use shortening. So I'm gonna use straight out shortening to cut in the fat. Can you substitute? I wouldn't. The, but the, the, you're getting, you know, the, the, con, the density, the consistency is going to be from the shortening. Now, when you use shortening, you use little pebbles at a time, okay? See that? That's like half a teaspoon at a time. You could use your fingers. And we're gonna cut, this is called cutting in. The fat and look what I'm, how much I'm using. Um, the recipe, the recipe is calling for um, quarter cup of shortening, but I'm going to cut it in in small pebbles. So you don't want to just throw it all in. You want to put it in like small amounts. And what this will do is develop little air pockets in your food, which will make a big difference in how, you know, flaky or browny your uh, biscuit is. I'm just cutting in little, little bits. Quarter cup. All right, cool. And that is that. Okay, so just to reiterate, so far in there, we have the flour, we have the baking soda, we have the salt, we have the shortening that just went in, we have. Um, that's uh, the garlic salt. Okay, good. I put in that. Excellent. Now we're going to put in a quarter cup of grated cheddar cheese. I've said this before. Cheese, you're better off buying blocks of cheese and grating it yourself. It's less money and the quality is usually better because it's, you know, the way food works, the more that's exposed to the air, the less quality, the more quality you're going to lose. So whatever you get, you're always better off buying it in a brick. So in goes the cheddar cheese. If you have dried chives, you can throw them in now. That be uh, put them right in now. I don't have dried chives. I have fresh chives tonight, but they're they're outside, so I'm not going to get them. But uh, okay, you could put them in or not. So. Let's pretend I put in my chives, and here goes my milk, three quarters of a cup of milk. So 
starting to gather together. Okay, now if I didn't tell you this already, you got to bring your oven up to 450. My oven's at 350. I'm going to bring it up to 450. You need a hot oven for biscuits. Okay. Okay, and everything's gathered. Let's see, I'll give it another little mix. If you're using a, a biscuit mixer like this, you're always best off to take a little something like this and just scrape down the sides to get it all from the bottom. Because sometimes there's a, like a little gap on the bottom where it's still wet. So you want to get in there and move it around. There you go. Like that's it. It doesn't have to be over mixed. It just has to be together. Okay. You know, you're not building up glutens or anything in this. So I'll show you what it looks like. It's all together and it's going to form what looks like this kind of ball. Now it doesn't have to ball, but it's like this. It's like almost like a batter, but like it's a more of a dough than a batter. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna do what's called a drop biscuit. We're not gonna get fancy. We don't have to roll it out. We can, but I'll show you how I'm gonna do it. So First thing you need is a baking sheet. I have to take a little, what I do is uh, you cut a little piece of parchment and on the bottom of your baking sheet, if you put a tiny bit of butter, your parchment will stick, makes it easier, okay? Then you're gonna take what is a heaping spoonful, okay? This is um, by heaping spoonful, I'd say that is a heaping spoonful, okay? And just like that. You don't want them touching. Let's see how many we get. Any questions, everybody cool? Try to make things the same size. This way, when they bake, they will bake evenly. If one is giant and one is small, it's gonna be a different situation. Now, you could roll biscuits out you could cut them out. There's a lot of different ways to do things. This is called the drop biscuit. So we're not looking for super fancy. Um, and this will be it. Now, there's no reason to let this rise or anything. You can just put it right in the oven when the oven hits 450. And we should have a nice biscuit in about 10 or 15 minutes. I'll give everybody a second to catch up. Let everybody get a chance to get the oven up to 450. And that, my friends, will be that. Get ready, get set, pimento cheese next. I'm gonna clean out my bowl here, because I'm gonna do it in the same mixing bowl. I gotta get myself a second mixing bowl. Now I've made pimento cheese in food processors, that works too. Um, but since everything is at room temperature, it's gonna work well. 
if your stuff's a little harder, then like you didn't let it sit out long enough, then sometimes you're better off doing it in a food processor because it'll cut it up a little more. But mine should be good. So pimento cheese is cheddar cheese with a couple of extra ingredients in it. That's all it is. There's no like special guy that's making pimento cheese in his backyard. Like you see regular cheeses, kind of doesn't work like that. It's just a mix of these ingredients and that's all a pimento cheese is. Now, you can, you can put in a pimento cheese things to make it more spicy if you like. Um, my wife doesn't really eat spicy, so I'm not going to put super duper amounts of spicy things in here. So I'm going to use an extra sharp cheddar cheese, which I've already ground up myself. And it's room temperature. It's going right in there. I'll use the paddle. I'll use the whisk mix. For any questions up until now? Everybody's cool? Okay. So I'm going to use my, uh, I'll use my paddle attachment again. Could use a whisk. Could use your whisk attachment. That would work. I'll use my paddle. Because things are pretty soft. If they weren't soft, I would use I would use a whisk. Okay, in went my cheese. On top of my cheese is gonna go my uh, sour cream. Cream cheese, yep, cream cheese. This is a pack of eight inch, eight ounce uh, sour cream. Now, cream cheese. I don't know why I keep saying sour cream, but anyway. I find there's a difference. I use Philadelphia cream cheese. I don't like the store brand Publix cream cheese for some reason. This is, I don't know, maybe because I've been using it my whole life. I'm not sure, but okay. So in went my cream cheese, my regular cheddar cheese. Um, next step is going to be a half cup of mayonnaise. Now, I have said that I have switched to Duke's mayonnaise since I've been living in Florida, but I couldn't pass up these Hellman's on sale two for one at Publix. So I, I went back to Hellman's just for this, but you know, I'm a big Duke's fan. And I think if I'm going to make pimento cheese, Duke's mayonnaise is the move. Okay. So this is a half cup. Okay, good. Now I'm going to move it up, give it a little mix just to get it going. Okay, in starts now a couple of other things. The onion powder and garlic powder. Onion powder. Okay. Garlic powder. Okay, and what makes pimento cheese pimento cheese is the pimento. And here's some black pepper too. Thanks. I have some jalapeno. That's always good for there. Now the pimento, um, you don't need any of the juice. You just need the pimento. You use the whole four ounces. This is a big one. So I'm going to use half of these. And I want you to cut them up so you don't have to worry about the size of your pimento. Just a quick chop. Use half of it. Well, I call recipe close for four ounces in your recipe, I believe. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Okay, my oven's at 450. Is my oven at 450? Sure. All right, in go my biscuits. Okay. Here's my choppity chop for my pimentos. Yeah, 15 minutes. Pimentos, you know, get them a good size. Okay. Into your mix for your pimento cheese.
All right, and the mix she is on again. Now you really, really want this incorporated. So give it a minute, give it, you know, two, three minutes of, of a good mix. Now, a couple little extra little tippity tips you could put in your pimento cheese. If you want to make it spicy, you could put hot sauce in your pimento cheese, jalapenos in your pimento cheese. You could put Worcestershire in your pimento cheese. Also, something else that is a good, great item. You make pimento cheese and you could chop up crab is great in pimento cheese, like crab, like a crab dip. You could put in um, the, in, the um, fake crab, the pollock, that's like $2 in the supermarket. That's great in pimento cheese. Shrimp is great in pimento cheese. You know, um, hit it, hit it hard with any of those things. You want a little heat? I see Josh is making a move for the hot sauce. Is that right? Chili sauce is great in pimento cheese. I did a consult a couple of years ago for a sports, but not a sports, but like a fancy kind of bar tavern in New York and I had pimento cheese as an item on the bar. I made some of my own crackers, my own pimento cheese. It was banging. People loved it, you know, because it's like you put it in a crock, you know, I'll show you. Okay, cool. So what what it's really pretty um yeah, so, and that's like the consistency. It looks like West Pride, like this. You know what, this is the point you should taste it. And you're looking, do you need more salt? Do you need more pepper? Do you need more hot sauce? What do we need in there, Pam? Things good just like that? Okay, cool. So. Now I know this is for the sandwich, but if you wanted to use it as dip in your house, I'll show you what I would do. Just a little extra bonus here tonight in our copycat class, plating. So if you have a little crock, like a little, I guess like a soup crock, what I would do, if you wanted to serve it separately, I would go directly into your soup crock, okay? Then I put it into your refrigerator for an hour or so. You don't want it super, super cold, but you also don't want it warm. So you want it something in the middle. And then you have this really nice, you know, homemade, I mean, seriously, homemade cheese. And then I would take the top, and if I have any parsley, I might put that on top. Um, black pepper, maybe just a touch of salt more on top. And then I take my, uh, some of my pimento strips and like that. And that's like really nice. If you're putting out a cheese plate or you're having a barbecue and you want to do instead, you know, something special for the top of your hamburger. I mean, bacon, pimento cheese on top of a burger. I mean, that's just banging. You know what I mean? So it looks like this. Nice. Josh, you notice how I didn't drop it? <laughs> Good, okay, awesome. Okay, and I used your word too, I'm sorry. A little, that's my goal in life, making Josh turn red, I love it. Okay, so anyway, there it is, beautiful pimento cheese. Any questions, my copycat friends? We're good. All right. A little more diet soda, and away we go to the next thing. So our biscuits should be in the oven. They should be cooking at uh, 450. 
lightly greased baking dish or on parchment paper. They're in there, they have a little cheese, they're ready to go. Our pimento cheese is banging and ready. And here's your next little tippity tip, bacon. <clears throat> Everybody has uh, had their bacon pre-cooked. Now, Art Smith, whoops, oh, oh, my sign fell. Art Smith has a particular flavor bacon on his uh, uh, menu. And I don't know what the flavor was, a lot of times you can't do anything about that because they smoke the bacon with like pecan or smoke it with applewood. So when it says applewood smoked bacon, you can't do anything about it unless you're making your own bacon. But what you can do is, so I did my bacon and the way I do my bacon is uh, aluminum foil on a sheet tray. I lay it out flat so they're not touching and these are cook until they're crisp. What I wanted, what you can do now, let's say you want a sweeter bacon, you just drizzle a little honey on top of it, it goes maple syrup, you put it back into the oven and you let it cook for like four or five minutes. Now, you don't wanna kill it, okay? Cause it's sugar and it's sticky and you could A, burn it, but B, it won't be as like, look how firm that is. You don't wanna kill it. So you just wanna drizzle some maple syrup on top of it, um, some honey on top of it. You could put a shot of hot sauce on top of it, like that. You don't wanna add more salt because bacon is cured in salt and it'll just taste bad, okay? So that's how you can make a flavored bacon. This is what I like to do. I like black pepper on top of my bacon. I go right across it with some black pepper. Then right before service, which is when you eat it, in the restaurant they call that service, you stick it in the oven. It's nice and crispy and bacon, by the way, when I make it in restaurants, let's say I'm doing a bit, I'll make bacon in the morning and we'll have it for the day because you could just reheat it and it crisps up because it's all fat. I mean, that's what bacon is. So bacon should be crispy like this. Look how beautiful, this is like perfect bacon, okay? Every chef in the world has burned bacon in their life. That's kind of like a rite of passage when you become a chef, you burn your bacon. But you burn, you don't just burn eight pieces of bacon, you burn a case of bacon by putting one stack in the oven on giant sheet trays and you forget about the whole thing and they all turn black and your boss yells at you because you just burned $40 worth of bacon. So watch your bacon, it'll burn quick. Okay, so there's my bacon. There's a couple things to flavor your bacon if you wanted to. You could put cayenne pepper on your bacon if you want. I mean, you really have a lot of, uh, lot of choices. Okay, my biscuit's going. Uh huh. Okay. Say it again. It's just chicken or gravy left. Yep. Yeah, well, we have right. We have left the sawmill gravy and we have the chicken. Now <clears throat> we're gonna do the chicken last, and I'm gonna tell you the reason why. When you have chicken on the menu in your house and you're doing a number of different things like this, chicken's one of the few things that can make you sick. So you do it last. That way you don't cross contaminate your whole kitchen. Why do it first? That way you have chicken on everything and then you touch everything and it's a mess. So in my world, you cook at home, especially cook everything first and chicken is last. This way you're keeping your area sanitary. Comprende? Comprende. Also, when you're cooking chicken on a cutting board, okay, here's another little tip, bleach. You have bleach in the house. You don't need a cup of bleach, okay? Bleach is one part, bleach to one million parts of water. You need a teeny weeny tiny bit of bleach. If you get a wolf of bleach, like, what? that means you use too much bleach. If your eyes are burning because there's so much bleach, you're using too much bleach. You need a little tiny bit. You could take um, a cup like this, and you could take, just put some a little bit on a napkin. That's the amount of bleach you need. You wipe down your area and then you soap it up and you get rid of it and go to another another thing. In kitchens, professional kitchens, we never cut chicken on wood cutting boards. You always cook them on a plastic cutting board to butcher them and then you keep it separate. And they're actually color coded as red in a lot of kitchens, sometimes white. So I'm not saying to go so crazy, but I'm just saying that like these are the safety concerns of uh, what's going on. Okay, so everybody take a swig of their, uh, you know, Paps Blue Ribbon in honor of our Southern uh, 
night here or your uh, Miller Lite or your Bud or uh, a glass of water is good too. And I'll go for my Diet Coke. And then we're going to go into, uh, there you go. Dave doesn't disappoint. What do you got there, Dave? Yeah, that's actually, oh, should I have him make a drink? Bud Light, that's what I'm talking about. Right. You know, a lot of times when we do these classes, we do these copycat classes, we have Josh make a drink. But, I mean, if you're going to eat chicken and biscuits and gravy, I mean, for dinner, I mean, it's all about a beer as far as I'm concerned, you know. Or just straight up Jack Daniels. I mean, those are your two two choices. Or maybe some whiskey, you know. I don't know. Sweet tea. Mm -hmm. Sweet tea? That's it. There you go, Sue. That's it. Good idea. Sweet tea. That We should have done sweet tea. That would have been good. That's sweet perfect. Tea and, perfect. Sweet tea and Tito's, uh, Tito's vodka. That works, too. That works, too. <laughs> straight up sweet tea. Yeah. There's, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Morrissey. Yep. That, cheers to you, sir. Okay. okay. Okay, a gravy, gravy 101. So we're going to do what they call sawmill gravy. This is a classic southern gravy that uses only a couple of ingredients. But the good news is it's going to be delicious. And the method is really, really simple. And I'm going to show you all how to do it. See, I cook southern food for 15 minutes and I'm already saying, y'all, see? <laughs> Yeah, there you go, my biscuits. There they are. They're getting, starting to get a little color. Okay. So I'm just setting up my uh, cooking area here for you. Now, first thing we're going to do is we're going to brown our um, sausage. This is mild fresh pork now they so um sawmill gravy is traditional breakfast sausage but if you don't have breakfast sausage and you have a this is a fresh ground uh, pork sausage now what makes it sausage other than just ground pork well flavorings i mean inside of this is you know salt pepper flavors of all the different kinds so this is out of the casing and i'm going to cook it up and that's what I want you to do. I want you to take your um, sausage. And I'm not going to even use that much because I know that I think in my household, I might be the only one eating this tonight. <laughs> my wife's very particular. Okay, so... That's one thing about Pam. If Pam likes what I'm making, she pays extra attention to make sure I'm doing it right. So that way when she eats it, she knows it's good, okay? So she'll watch. I know Pam doesn't care what I'm making. If she doesn't care for what I'm making, she's kind of like, you know, looking around, checking her emails, but that's it. You know who's way more concerned about what I'm making with this sausage? My dog. This just kills him. All he wants to do is eat this. Okay, so... One pound breakfast sausage is going to go into this. It says to use a cast iron skillet. Um, not a bad idea, but I can't do it because this is an induction burner. I do it in front of you guys so you can kind of see. I'll move it up a little more. Cast iron skillet, though, is, is an awesome thing to have. I have mine back here. I'm going to fry in in a bit. In a bit. This is a cool cast iron. This is a 1957 piece of cast iron that a cousin of mine refinished it. That's his hobby. But if you ever get a piece of refinished cast iron, it's different than modern cast iron. It's much thinner. You know, pan, I, had a pan, I had a cast iron pot that I used for years. And, you know, and one day it was missing. I don't know what happened. It was so heavy, this cast iron pot, Pam couldn't lift it up. So I don't know what happened. I think that someone may have thrown it away because it was so heavy. Um, I might biscuit seed another five minutes. But it was yeah, but I, she, the, the story is she says it was ruined. I don't, I don't know. Your biscuit, your um, sausages need to be brown. It's going to take a couple minutes. 
and my alarm just went off for my uh, my biscuits, but I'm going to give them another couple of minutes because I want to try to get them a little more color on them. So anyway, somehow my cast iron pan went missing, but I got lucky because my cousin gave me this cast iron, new cast iron. This is so much better. It's half the weight and it's much thinner and you don't have to wait. So that's like re that's a refinished cast iron. Just a little side interest. And if you want one, this is what it looks like. This is called Griswold. That's the name of it. I was the name of this company, Griswold. And then you have to learn how to maintain it and everything. Hey, Adam, I got a question yes. for you. If yeah. I wanted to add a little sweetness to my sausage, right, like maybe do like a maple flavored sausage, could I, could I right now while it's cooking add in a little bit of uh, like pure maple syrup? Um, well, no. well, well, yes or no. What I would do if you wanted to do that, I would wait till the sausage is done cooking. So this way, when you put in the sugar, it doesn't burn. So you just kind of drizzle it on top, put it off to the side. Hi, hi, Taylor. And then you put it off to the side and then let it sit there. If you wanted to make like a maple sausage or something like that. Yeah, see, yeah, Pam makes a good point, Josh. If you made your sausage sweet, it might be a little weird in your gravy because your gravy is not like a, it's like a savory gravy. So, but if you're making breakfast, yeah, but if you, yeah, I, so I, I probably wouldn't do that. So, anyway, uh, I'm breaking up this, okay, and I'm going to take it to 80%, okay. I'm going to take it to about 80%. Okay, and I'm going to remove it now from the pan and put it into a separate container here. And I'm going to leave in two tablespoons of fat. Now, my sausage did not render a lot of fat, okay? As a matter of fact, it rendered no fat. So what am I going to do? Am I going to panic? Am I going to throw a fit? Am I going to go nuts? No. What am I going to do? I'm just going to add some my own fat. So I'm going to put my sausage off to the side, and I'm going to put some fat. Now, the kind of fat that I want to use is butter, okay? Because what you're creating actually in here is a roux. Now, the recipe calls for... Um, um, about two tablespoons of fat. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to even actually go up to three tablespoons of fat. And if you never noticed on a stick of butter, it gives a breakdown. So you cut it right there like I did. I'm going to melt it in there and I'm going to create what they call a roux. And I'm going to melt this there. Now the roux would be created or the volute is going to be created Regardless, if there is fat, if your uh, sausage rendered two tablespoons of fat, great. You don't need the butter. Mine didn't, so I'm going to put in the butter. I'm going to melt it down, and then I'm going to get my flour ready, and it's going to be a quarter cup of flour. Quarter cup of flour to two tablespoons of fat. Melting it down. See where my biscuits are at. Oh yeah, they're getting brown. Okay, I'm just gonna shut off my, I'm gonna shut my uh, oven off, pull out my biscuits. Thank you. There, a little drop biscuit, excellent. I could have made them bigger. I made them. I made them smaller. But they look perfect. Okay. My fat's melted in my pan. Inside of this is going to go a quarter cup of flour. It's okay, I can do this. And there it is. Okay. Mix, mix, mix. Okay, and this is going to start to 
thicken up a little bit. You're going to be making a roux. And this is called a pan gravy, by the way. And this is a great way. I mean, Thanksgiving time and all, you know, we're going to have classes then. I'll, I'll show you how to make a pan gravy with your droppings in the pan. See you, my dear. So this is bubbling. I'm going to give it a minute or two. And right into this is going to go um, some milk. The amount of milk um, calls for two cups of milk. Don't put in two cups of milk. Start with a cup of milk, and then we'll put in another cup, okay? So it's going to start boiling, and it's going to start thickening up. Now it's starting to thicken. Now it's turning into like a glue consistency very quickly. What does that mean? That means I need more liquid in more liquid goes. Again, I'm not putting in the full two cups. I'm putting in another quarter cup. I'm going to go nice and slow. And you want to mix it now so that you don't see any lumps yet because you don't have in it. And you can see how it's getting the consistency of a gravy. Okay. Now I need a little more. Goes more milk. Stir it up. And the reason it's thickening up is because of the, obviously, the roux that you put in there. And you want to cook it for a couple of minutes. I'm going to put in a little salt. We don't want a lot of salt. I'm going to put in some black pepper. <coughs> now, can you flavor this with other things? Sure. Can you put in garlic powder, onion powder? Yeah, you could do all that. But this is a pretty straightforward. Now, here's my uh, sausage, okay? I'm going to break my sausage up into little bits like there is already. And you want this to continue to boil because you want to cook out the flour out of your gravy. Okay, I'm going to put in the rest of my milk because I think that's going to be the perfect amount. I'm going to let it cook again until it thickens again. You know, I've learned that you could always add, real easy to add more liquid and real hard to take it out once you put in too much. So take your time, you know what I mean? Like you don't need to, you know, don't throw it all in. You know, there's a little mantra that I, I learned when I first started cooking, and it's you control the flame. The flame doesn't control you. And that goes for everything. You control the gravy. The gravy doesn't control you. What that means is don't panic. Take it off the heat. Add what you need. Try again. There's no, there's no competition. There's no rush. Okay, this is getting nice and thick or thicker, but not too thick. You see, the, you see that? Now, here's another little secret. Inside of your, you know, there's coagulation ingredients in your sausage that's making it coagulate. So in goes my sausage. And I'm going to mix it now for two, three minutes. Breaking it up a little bit. If you didn't take out your biscuits, if you put them in when I put in mine, take them out. Yeah, this is going to be really good. Now, let's say <coughs> we don't want to eat this tonight. We want to eat it tomorrow. Okay, so it's all cooked, ready to go. What's probably going to happen is it's going to coagulate because you have the fats from the sausage. You have the fats from the milk, you have the roux, you have the butter, it might coagulate, no sweat. In the morning, you put it in a pan like this, slowly heat it up and you slowly add a little more milk. It, it, it opens up, you taste it, salt and pepper, that's it. Just don't dump the milk in there, just slowly salt and pepper. So there it is. You know, to me, uh, gravies are like really satisfying. They're kind of like making bread. They feel cool when they come together and they, and there it is. Sawmill gravy. This method of making gravy on top of your stove is awesomely great when you're Thanksgiving, you make a chicken gravy. I could, you can make a hundred gravies. What makes this a sawmill gravy is the sausage in it. It's a real simple gravy, milk, flour, salt, pepper, sausage, and Shazam, there you are, your old Southern cook.
Okay, so that's going to be that. So I'm going to put that to the side. This your consistency should look like a like a gravy. It shouldn't be super thick. Should have nice big chunks of sausage. If you have some parsley, you can throw it in there. Some cilantro. You want to put in some hot sauce. You want to put in some chili flakes. All of it works. All of it works. Any questions before we move on to our fried chicken uh, situation? Okay, I'm gonna give everybody a minute to catch up before I uh, do the fried chicken, which is our last step in our uh, Art Smith Hallelujah Biscuit. What a great name. Give everybody a minute or so to catch up and move this out my way. <coughs> Excuse me. And I'm gonna teach you all the standard breading procedure which is the first thing I learned in culinary school one day. And they, not only did I learn it in culinary school immediately, but they named it the Culinary Institute of America's Standard Breading Procedure. They were very proud of their breading procedure. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. So, give everybody a second. Everybody ready? Anybody need a minute? A thumbs up. Paul gave me a thumbs up. Okay, good. That's it. I got a Christian thumbs up. Bobby, you good, Bobby? Bobby's good. Okay. Dave, I know he's good. Cause he got he got the kick kick but two chefs there working. Very nice. Josh, he will. Uh, he thumbs up from Josh. Okay. Forward we move. <clears throat> so. This chicken, we soaked in buttermilk. Now, why did we soak it in buttermilk? Well, buttermilk has an enzyme in it. Buttermilk is a living, breathing entity. And there's an enzyme in milk. And there's an enzyme, especially in buttermilk, that breaks things down. So when you, so when you marinate something in buttermilk like chicken, it will change the texture of the chicken. And it will turn the chicken into a product that you really can taste the tanginess of the buttermilk. So when you soak, now, if you have a th thin piece of steak, for example, like a piece of, um, like a not, a, not a strip steak, like a thin, like a Romanian skirt steak, you can even soak that in buttermilk, it works. Um, milk works great. You could soak lamb chops in, in buttermilk. A lot of things buttermilk is very effective for. Um, but, this is my chicken sat over uh, four hours minimum. You need about four hours. The more dense, the more dense something is, the longer it needs to soak. It's kind of like a person. The more dense they are, the more you need to speak to them about something. Same concept. Has to be, it's dense, you see? So I'm going to take, there's my buttermilk on my chicken. I'm going to dump it into a bowl with my buttermilk that it's been soaking in. Now, here's another little tippity tip. I use these, these sealed bags all the time, especially with chicken, but they work with anything. And why they're so good is I do my business, whatever it is, I throw it in the garbage. And with chicken, there's no cross-contamination. Look, in the garbage, and I'm done. It also holds it. And also, if you have a stinky refrigerator like me where there's no space, it's perfect, you know? So... Get and spend money. Don't see because if you buy if you buy a bad bag that opens up in your refrigerator, you're gonna hate me. Spend the money on a good Ziploc bag. That's like pick your battles where to spend money. That to me is a good place. Okay, so I have my chicken in here. Now we use chicken tenders. Okay, I personally don't like chicken tenders. I don't like white meat chicken, but that's what um, most Americans are accustomed to. So. These are, I'm a, I'm a dark meat chicken guy, what can I say? So that's, that's me. But I'm not going to tell the world what to do. I will say, though, that if you have a chicken tender, okay, in a chicken tender, there's a white strip in the back of sinew, okay? You need to peel that out, okay? You take a knife, you hold it flat, and you get rid of it. It's like a strip of white that's in your chicken tender. Get rid of it. Okay, um, that's that's the first thing. Then you take your chicken tender and you put it on a little board. You flatten it out a little bit. Okay, if you didn't do any of those things, 
you could flatten out your chicken now a little bit. Um, your chicken should not be big and thick. It should be a thin, thinner strip because we're going to fry it. Okay? So there it is, my chicken and my buttermilk. Here it is, some flour and egg. Okay? This is just beaten up egg. Um, and now we're going to put some salt and pepper. Okay? I season all of it. Because when you season it before you fry it, you're going to get more flavor in it. Okay? Now I need a little receiving area, which is going to be a sheet tray. And on that sheet tray is going to go a little more flour. That's my receiving area. Next, your biscuit should be out of the oven. Okay? So you're going to go with your, you're going to go wet. The, the, you have one wet hand, one dry hand. So here's my wet hand. My wet hand with my chicken strip. I'm going to get off my buttermilk. I'm going to put it in to my dry. I'm going to take my dry hand. I'm going to pat it down just like this. Okay. Then I'm going to go back into my wet. I'm going to take my wet hand again. Get it in there. Some people like to wear gloves. Okay, so it's wet, and then we're going to do one more time back into dry with my dry hand, cover it up, pat it down, take your time. You really want to coat it. This is what the kernel calls extra crispy. Okay, and you see how nice that's stuck there, how it's all coated nice? That's one chicken, and push down on it. That's one chicken tender. So I'm going to take that one nice chicken tender that's all nicely breaded. I'm going to put it right onto my floured um, sheet tray and let it sit. Let's do it again. Now, I take my wet hand. I put, put it into my wet ingredient. Shake off my buttermilk. I put my dry hand into my dry ingredient. Push it down so it sticks. Shake a shake a shake a off. Push, shake, wet ingredient. There it goes. Okay, let it drip out. We're in no rush. And it's going to use more flour and more egg than you think. This middle bowl is not a good bowl for this. Okay, you want something that you could really lay it flat in. And the other thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to, okay. Gonna need a little more flour. So this way, look look how nice it's breaded. I'm gonna a little, a little bit more flour. Pam's now getting me the perfect bowl. Thank you, Pam. Okay, put it down right there. Yeah, I'll put the rest of this flour in it. Yeah, don't be, don't be, Lee, um, yeah, don't be stingy with your flour. <clears throat> the more flour you have, the easier this is going to be. I'm giving my hands a little wash. Salt and pepper again, Pam says. Put, don't forget the salt and pepper. You know what that means? Pam's going to be eating it. That's all that means. She tells me, don't forget the salt and pepper. There's no doubt in my mind Pam's going to be eating this with dinner. Okay. So <laughs> Pam's laughing because she knows it's so true. Okay. So this is going to be my wet hand into the dry, my dry hand on top. This double coating, by the way, this going back and dipping it twice is going to make the difference between like really crispy fried chicken and not crispy fried chicken. Shake a shake a shake a lay it in there. Dripping out. 
Now, this is a good time to tell everybody that we are going to have a couple of brand new copycat classes that we are working on that will be up and mailed to you, emailed to you um, probably within the week. And they're going to be cool. They're going to be different. And we're going to probably have about three or four more classes before the end of May. And uh, then we, uh, we're going to see what happens for the summer. But we're going to keep going, man. There's so much great food. So much great food at, uh, at the parks. Okay. Here we go. One more time. Dry. I switched hands. Yeah, I'm dyslexic. I have all sorts of learning disabilities and stuff. But you know what? We we all get the point in what I'm doing here. Okay. And I'm just going to pick up my speed a little bit. See how much flour I'm using? A lot of flour. Flippity flop. All right, Pam, give me a little more flour. Right in there, and then we're going to, I'm going to do all of it. Because I have some people in the house. I know they're going to eat this. Chicken is never wet. Fried chicken is never wasted. Because it, cause it's one of those items that la that's so good the next day, you know. I'm going restaurant speed now. Okay. These are my last pieces, so it doesn't matter. Your leftover buttermilk, throw it away. Don't try to use it for something. It has raw chicken in it. Throw it right in the garbage. Cool beans, there it all is, okay. Now, I'm gonna take my airy here, I'm gonna just wipe off my hands real quick, and we're gonna get into the frying of the chicken. Then we are gonna assemble our hallelujah biscuit. Oh yeah. Now, as usual, I want you to post your pictures on Adam's Cooking Jam. I want you to post the pictures on your own website. Post the pictures. Josh will tell you where to post. Post them everywhere. Post them on the copycat cooking. Post them everywhere. Let your friends know about this so we can continue cooking with you all. Okay. I'm going to get rid of this whole board. So bear with me a second. All right. Move my whole board out of the way. Thank you. Clean as you go, folks. Clean as you go. Okay, so this is, by the way, let me show you this, what I have going on here. This is a great thing. If you ever want to keep your cutting board from moving, this is, um, what do they call this? Carpet, um, yeah. Well, it keeps carpets, from keeps carpets from moving. It works great for your cutting board. If you want to keep your cutting board. Now, if you don't want to use this, you could certainly use um, a wet towel that also works. But I'm going to trade out my cutting board for another one. Got my gravy here ready. And now I'm going to turn on my... Uh, Pan that I was talking about before. Let's see my my biscuit. Yeah, pretty good. It's a little nice. It's a little dense. Okay. Could be a little uh, flakier, but. For our purposes, it's going to be good. Okay, so I'm going to cut them. You can put them back in the oven if you want to. Once they're opened, they'll get a little crispier. Okay? 
biscuits also are something you have to work with. Sometimes they come out great, sometimes not. It depends on the humidity. It depends upon you, how much you mixed it, how good your baking powder is. So like that. Okay, anyway, get your, um, this is gonna take a minute or two to heat up. Okay, you know, my oil, my oil's heating up. It's also good you let your chicken sit for a little bit. You could get to this stage with the chicken and then you could take it and you could put it in your refrigerator for a couple hours and then you can cook it. It works perfectly great that way. You could also freeze it at this point and then fry it on pickup. That works great. Um, now, I don't normally do that in a restaurant because I don't like, because I'm always scared that the chicken's not going to get cooked through, but it certainly will work. Um, the best way to do it is just fry it. And then if you want to save it, you could freeze it. But the best thing to do is just fry it and eat it. Any questions? Dave, yeah, I don't see that in the recipe. I don't know. It's a, Dave's making, got a special recipe. He doesn't know. It's good. <laughs> what temp is the oil on? Okay, oil should be on 350, 375. 350 is usually the right temperature to temp oil. Now, if you're lucky enough to have a candy thermometer, which is what this is, this goes up all the way up to 400. Your normal thermometer doesn't, but this is a candy thermometer which tells you the different hardball, softball, the different temperatures of sugar, but it's a good way to test your oil. So I'm gonna put mine in, see where my oil's at. It's going, but it's not ready yet. If you don't have a candy thermometer, you could throw in a little piece of bread, and if it starts to fry up on the sides really quickly, then you know it's the right temperature. My candy thermometer is not ready yet. Um, also, this particular recipe calls for poached egg on top of it. So let me tell you all how to poach an egg. So I'm gonna show you a poached egg. Really simple. Um, now, is it a poached egg or a fried egg? a fried egg? Is it a fried egg or a poached egg? Does anybody know? Uh, Kristen and Paul, I think they know the. Chris, do you know what's a fried hey, egg? The, or a uh, the, the egg is done fried over easy. Fried over easy? Okay. So, so, so if we're in the that. south, it's all fried, right? Well, Correct. that's that's a good point. I guess that would be a little French. That would like be my French chef in me coming out. So okay, so we'll do a. Uh, I guess we'll do an over easy egg. I don't know what he said. What do you say, Josh? Okay, so I'm gonna use a. I'll make a one. Uh, one over easy egg. while we're waiting for the oil to heat up. Okay, my oil's starting to smoke. Turn it down and see where we're at. Goes up really fast. So, yeah, my oil's hot enough. I'm actually gonna let it cool for a second. Um, here's my, my egg. Tiny, teeny, tiny bit of fat. 
just a little. When my oil stops smoking. Let my egg work. And at this point, for my for my chicken, as my oil's heating off, I'm gonna use tongs. I never have to touch the raw chicken, see? So it can go right in like this. And again, frying chicken at home, that's also an art form. Oh, my egg broke. Now, there's only one reason my egg would have broken. Because when it went in there initially, it was whole. So when an egg breaks for no reason, when you haven't even touched it, that means the egg is old. Uh -oh. But it's okay. Yeah, we'll flip it over. Pam says it'll be okay. I'm not happy. Right, which just means exactly, I knew that, which means Pam's not having it. So, but for the picture, we made one. Okay, you need a separate uh, receiving area for your fried chicken. And what you can do is put down a little paper, absorb a little bit of the uh, oil when it comes off the chicken. Or you could put up kind of like a rack or something like that. That works out good too. Okay, Pam, tell me I got to open the garage because the watch out, Cooper, because it's starting to get a little smoky. Let's see, I got a little fan in here. That might help. Over goes my egg. You know, and the oil temperature is tricky. You know, you have to try to keep it at 350. This way you'll get your results um, without it burning, you know. You know. Having a little fry daddy, if you ever had one of those at home, those are really helpful because it'll maintain the oil temperature. I'm just maintaining this oil temperature by going up and down in my oven. Um, that egg's done. But that, that's how you maintain your oil temperature. And um, I keep looking. Now, remember I told you you want to make your chicken thin? The thinner you're making your chicken the easier it's going to be to cook towards the middle. So I'm going to give it a minute or two. And I'd say you take about three or four minutes on a side. Thanks. Temple, um, the oil, like it says, is like 350. This is my receiving. That's going to be for my plating. By the way, this is going to taste so much better than, this is going to taste equal or better than Art Smith's because we did everything right tonight. We did it all right. Right. 
So what I do is I took the biggest piece of chicken that's in there, okay, and I'm now going to cut the biggest piece of chicken in half and see if it's done. The biggest piece of chicken is done, that means all the small pieces are done too, okay? Okay, that's 100% cooked all the way through. This is Pam's biggest fear that chicken's going to be raw. Chicken's cooked completely through, and I'm going to take it right off of here. let some of the grease look at that golden brown not burned that's all about controlling your heat controlling your heat's hard to do chicken is a hard thing to maintain the proper um temperature of the so a little fried daddy is a great thing or candy thermometer candy thermometer is 20 bucks um if you don't have a candy thermometer that's a meat thermometer right chris that to me, what's it, does it go up? It might not go up high enough. That might be the problem with that. Yeah, the it goes up to, it's for our turkey deep fryer. It goes up to. Oh, oh that's good. It's a deep fry thermometer. Cool. Okay, good, good. Okay, so that's that. So this is how I would plate this, okay? I would split open my um, biscuit. Biscuit on the plate first. Actually, in a restaurant, I'll show you exactly what I would do. I don't know how Art Smith does it. This is how Adam Galgill would do it. Okay, I take a little bit of my pimento cheese, just a little tiny bit. I make two dots on the plate. That'd be the first thing I do. Second thing I do is I take my biscuit, I'd stick it right on there. So this way, the waiter can't move around and rock my food away. Okay, yeah, yeah, Josh, that's a good technique for you to stick the food to the plate with the pimento cheese. So two little things of pimento cheese. Okay, the next thing I would do is I'd take two pieces of chicken, perfectly cooked right on top, like this. My next move on top of that would be some um, bacon because I don't want it to actually melt. Um, I'm just, I don't want it, I want, you'll see what I mean. <clears throat> I don't want the cheese to melt. So, and I want to also, like when you plate things, just so you know, you're looking <coughs> for the customer to see every item on their plating. So you could see the bacon clearly now, right? You could see the chicken, you could see the roll underneath it. My next move would be, let me heat my gravy up a little bit. My next move would be my pimento cheese. I don't even know if pimento cheese is in this recipe, but I don't care, it would it? It is. It is fantastic. I put it right on top. It says on the menu. A nice dab of it right in the middle. Pimento cheese. My last two steps. I'm just my bit my my gravy, like I told you, got a little uh, congealed, which is perfect because we knew that was gonna happen, right? I'm heating up my gravy again for one minute. Oh yeah, only 25 calories. Okay, my gravy, I'm, I'm gonna put it the gravy, I'm not even gonna put the gravy, I'm gonna put it on the plate because so I could see all my beautiful things on the plate already. So I'm gonna put it around the sides of this. Wipe your plates and then Shazam. My last step is going to be my egg. I'll put my egg right on top. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't like to say what I made was perfect, but I mean, I have no choice to say it because it's this is perfect. Look at that. Beautiful. Hallelujah biscuit, my friends. We did it and it looks fabuloso. This really is gonna fill you up and is gonna be delicious. And I mean, you made the classics. You made fried chicken, you made 
soy milk gravy, you made a buttermilk biscuit, you made pimento cheese, you might as well be living in Alabama as far as I'm concerned. So there it all is. Any questions about anything before we uh, conclude? We are living in Alabama. I mean, we do live in Alabama, so this is just right for us. Whoa, that's cool. I'm so glad that I uh, just said if you live in Alabama, I could have went on for an hour about that, but I'm so glad that, that that's awesome that uh, you guys are now. That's so cool. So this is authentic, right, Dave? Is it authentic or not? I mean, truth? Oh, 100% authentic. All right, cool. Perfect. Thank you. I got an underlined Alabama, Alabamian told me this, this was supposed to look like, and I'm, I'm glad because uh, I am glad. Any questions before I vamoose? Josh, you have a finished product tonight? Let me see, Chris. Oh, cool. That looks good. I'm still waiting on my egg to cook. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. But this, this is nice. what I've got so far. <laughs> oh, cool, cool. I hear tail is giggling a little bit. I don't know. Hey, Josh, nip it down just a little bit. We couldn't see. Yeah. I think I think you see just fine. <laughs> Dave wants, you know, our next class. To, if you if you missed the last time, you know, Josh showed us our food. Oh, a nice. My egg. He showed us a nice food, and the whole thing fell. So we have a loop of that. We'll play next series, so you guys can see. So um, I know I should have to go. Yeah, next week, next week we are doing, wow, okay, so let me tell you about next week. Next week we're doing bread service at Sana. okay? So this is going to be a complicated class, even with my standards, but if you've ever eaten the bread service at Sana, it's like, to me, like the feature of the whole property. So I'm going to teach you how to make naan, which is a flat Indian bread. Even if you don't like the flavors of Indian food, the Indian bread, this flatbread, is a great, easy thing. You can make any, put anything on top of it. Then I'm going to make all these sauces with you guys and teach you how to make all these sauces. It's really going to be I something else. We're not going to do all of them. We're going to do some of them. And then um, following week, we're going to do beef bourguignon and creme brulee, which is like from France, which is like a great... The, the king of all beef stews, beef bourguignon. I'm going to teach you how to do it. One pot, easy, creme brulee, also not complicated. French toast, following that. The next week, banana, French toast. And then to conclude on the eighth, the braised short rib, wonton, squash soup, like real restaurant food. So I look forward to these classes, you know. When I first started, like we decided to do these classes, I wasn't sure what it was going to be. But they turned into great cooking classes because the food is really great. You know, the food in the parks are great. This is like no joke food. So I'm really happy to do it with everybody. And I'm happy everybody showed up. And thank you so much for coming tonight. And Josh, you have anything to add before we say uh, good night? Thank you, everyone, for watching. And um, Hey, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll just add thank you, everybody, for being here. It was uh, a lot of fun. Uh, I'm always running around with my looking like a chicken with his head cut off as I Try to do multiple different things. Um, but, okay, thank you, Taylor. Um, but, yeah, thank you so much, Adam, for showing us how to um, make this. Uh, we have we have a dining review from Chef Art Smith's, um, and I remember getting this uh, specific thing, and it's, it's fantastic. So I cannot wait to dive into this sandwich. I'm sure that it's going to be probably better uh, than Chef Art Smith's. But, uh, yeah, uh, I'm super excited for next week. So now bread service. It's gonna be great. Yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be banging. I'm gonna to try to get out the ingredients a little earlier because the ingredients are gonna be you're gonna to have to order some stuff on Amazon if you're in a place that doesn't have like specialty markets. All right, peace out, everyone. Thank you. Good night. All right, appreciate everybody. Thank Thanks. you guys. Good night. Thanks so much. Bye everybody. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Chef.